Please stand. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marvelous his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he starve many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the far skirt. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was partially treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shears. He was silent and opened not his mouth, oppressed and condemned. He was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny when he was cut off of the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people? A grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evil doers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood, but the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servants shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, For all my foes, I am the object of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a, fit, a dish that is broken. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God, in your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, 
A reading from the letter of the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. If you would please be seated. On page 64, we're going to read the Passion according to St. John, and we'll read it together. But what I'd like to do is say a few words before we read it to give you a framework in which we are reading it, and also to give you a few pointers, some things that you may want to look for as we read it together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The last time we read the Passion was on Palm Sunday. Someone who is very new to the Catholic faith. We grew up with this uh, all our lives. On Palm Sunday, on Good Friday, we read the Passion together. Think of someone who has never heard this from beginning to end. Someone who grew up without any faith in particular and certainly wasn't familiar with the Passion as we read it. This person sat there on Palm Sunday and heard it for the first time and then came back and asked some questions that were very interesting because it was from a totally different perspective. Like, what do you mean? We just know what this is. And the question they asked, why were they so angry? Why were the people so mean and spiteful and angry with Christ as he was carrying the cross? Why did they hitting him? Why the spitting at him? Why was this anger? there. I never thought of that. There was a great deal of anger in the people. What, why in a mob does it quickly turn to anger like that? <coughs> One of the reasons, thinking about it, that I can come up with is it's the anger. We could ask this question. The five-year-old, you're in the store with the five-year-old, and the five-year-old says, Daddy, buy that for me. And Daddy tells the five-year-old, no, I, I can't buy that for you. And the kid says, no, no, you, you can. Just take that thing out of your back pocket. There, there are little pieces of plastic in there. You put it on the counter, they'll give you anything you want. Daddy, I want that. Buy it for me. And Daddy knows. No, no, we're on a budget, you know. Uh, when it's your birthday, you know, maybe, but not now, not just because you want it. What does the five-year-old do at that point? The five-year-old says, oh, I understand, it. forget it. The five-year-old takes a major tantrum, and maybe the kid raises their voice, they start crying, 
And the kid has to be taken out of the store because you're making the spectacle of yourself. And how does it end? It ends with the kid turning around and saying what every parent has heard. I hate you. I hate you. You're the meanest father that ever existed. I hate you. My friend's father would have bought it for him. I hate you. And you know it's coming from a five-year-old, but it still hurts. I hate you. When the father thinks to himself, he hasn't bought a new pair of shoes in five years because the kids constantly need. And then the kid turns around and says, I hate you. It hurts. There's, there's a sting to it. You let it go, but you know, you're bleeding a little bit from a flesh wound when the kid says that. Why were the people so angry? Because they finally realized our Lord was not going to give them exactly what they wanted. And once they weren't going to get what they wanted, they were angry at him. Your God, you can do this if you want. We saw you do things. We saw you walk on water. We saw you raise dead people to life. What do you mean, no? What do you mean you won't give us what we want? And what is it we want? We want you to take the Romans away from us. We don't want to have to pay their taxes anymore. We don't want to get sick. We don't want it to rain too much. We don't want it to be too cold or too hot. We don't want any trouble in our family. We don't want problems with our neighbors. We want to live in perfect peace and harmony, and we never want to get sick, and we all want to live perfectly healthy to 183. That's what we want, God. And you're God, and you can give that to us. And when he doesn't, any one of those things in particular, or any part of one of those things, or any variation on one of those things. When he doesn't give us what we want, we get a tantrum, and we're angry at him. And in our tantrums, when we lose control like that, we say and do mean things to each other and to God as well. So that's kind of the answer. Why were they so angry? Because they didn't get what they wanted. And that's been the story from then until now. We all ask God for things. We want from God. And not necessarily bad things, but they're the things we want. Of not necessarily selfish. We just want God to kind of understand how we want our lives arranged and cooperate with us. That if I could only have like total control over my life, God, it would be much happier. So this is basically what we're usually telling God, how we want our life to unfold and telling him if he could arrange that and we ask with the same attitude as the five-year-old. It's in your back pocket. You're God. You can do it. Now do it for me. And when he does it, we're angry with him. And sometimes we get mean with God. And we get spiteful with God. And how many people will look to a point in their life when they stop going to church, when they stop saying their prayers because of the disappointment? It didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen. Now, watch. The people have realized this now. They've realized that when they see him arrested and put on trial before Pontius Pilate and then before the high priest, oh, they realize that, no, no, he's not going to deliver at all. He's got things in his back pocket. There's a lot he can deliver, but he's certainly not going to give me what I want. And that's what generated the anger and the meanness. Now, look for this as you're listening to the Passion. And the Passion of St. John is very interesting. 
anything that St. John writes in his gospel uh, or in one of his epistles at the back of the Bible, I tend to perk up and say, if St. John the Apostle is talking, pay close attention. Or St. Peter, or St. James in their epistles, because they were always with Jesus. He always picked out those three. St. Luke, St. Mark, St. Matthew, maybe. He was there, but not as close as St. John and St. James and St. Peter. St. John especially was very close to our Lord. He was the youngest of the apostles. The thought was he may have been even as young as like 18, 19, 20. He played, quote, the kid in the group of apostles. People in any group assume a role. The role that he assumed was, I'm the kid. He likes me because I'm the kid. So we see that St. John is always getting very close to our Lord. And a lot of times when our Lord was praying, John would go sit next to him and listen to his words and write them down for us. And our Lord didn't say, go away, I'm praying. He let him stay and let him listen. So when St. John is telling us things that our Lord said, I pay close attention. But he, he was there, and he was listening. And the other evangelists may have heard it from other apostles, but John, we got direct witness to what our Lord said. At the very beginning, the narrator is going to read a line that says, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen to him. That's not a throwaway line. That's a statement about Christ. That at any given moment, he was human. He could be hurt like a human being. But at the same time, he was God. And at any given moment, he knew. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what people were thinking. He knew what people were saying. He read their motives, what was behind it. He knew because he was God. Why did St. John say that? Because in the three years that they were together, many times Christ probably told St. John what he knew and what he understood. And a lot of times St. John will write in his gospel that Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, he knew. He was God. So all this that's going on, he knows exactly what's coming. He knew every angry word that was spoken. He knew every slap. He knew who did it. He knew why they did it. He knew their disappointment and the reason for their anger. He knew. Another thing to look for, and St. John is is very emphatic on this. The cause of disappointment, he is not giving us what we want. St. John understood that. And St. John remembered and wrote for us everything in the Passion narrative in which Christ's answers repeated what he had said before over three years. I've come to open the gates of my kingdom, but the gates are not here. The gates of my kingdom, which is heaven, which is not a temporary place like here, the gates of my kingdom are to an eternal place, forever and ever, heaven. They've been closed by sin. They've been closed by your anger, your spitefulness. They've been closed by your disappointment. They were closed when Adam and Eve had the Garden of Eden and said, it's not enough. I want something more. That ingratitude closed the gates of my kingdom. I've come 
to open my kingdom so that people may enter, but my kingdom isn't here. And that became the big problem because the answer was, I don't want a kingdom that's there. I want now. And you're going to hear that our Lord, one last time, is trying to explain that in St. John's Passion again and again. Last point to look for in St. John's Virgin of the Passion, Pontius Pilate. <coughs> I like what St. John, he takes a different approach to the person of Pontius Pilate. The other evangelist, Pilate was the Roman judge. Pilate had the power to release Christ, but he was too cowardly. He was afraid of what other people would think. He didn't want to hurt his career. He wanted there to be peace. Even if one had to die, it's my, not my problem. I just want peace. Truth has nothing to do with it. I want everything to be calm. That's the approach the others. St. John goes into great detail about back and forth between Pontius Pilate and the priests in the temple, the high priest uh, and Herod. He goes back and forth, and you'll notice there are maybe four or five times when Pontius Pilate tells them, I want to release this Jesus to you. And he's trying to persuade the people to allow him to do that. And they are adamant. They're not going to budge. No. And at one point, after he has him scourged, so you've got Christ who's received 40 lashes uh, with the, the Roman whip, and he's a bleeding mess. And he shows him to the people like that. He says, is this enough? I'll let him go now, okay? You, 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 got, you got your punishment. He tried, and they said, no, no, it's not enough. Cru crucify him. And then at the end, listen for the line. Pilate has, when they crucified these people, whoever the Romans were crucifying, it was at the entrance to the city, a public place, so that everyone who passed by could see the punishment. They would write what the crime was and attach it to the cross. Our Lord's crime, according to the temple priests, was that he said he was the king of the Jews. He said he had a kingdom. And that was his crime. So Pilate wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, and had it tacked to the top of the cross. And then at the end, after all this, the temple priests come back to him and say, could we reword that? Uh, I don't like the way you worded it. And watch what Pilate's answer is. Basically he said, get out of here. I've had it with you people. Just go away. No more. It's done. This is what you wanted. I'm not changing a thing. Some thoughts, themes that we're going to look for, an understanding, a framework for the reading of the Passion. I'm going to ask you now to please turn to page 64. <clears throat> and as we always do, you do the chorus part. St. John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden, into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. But Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, 
whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus has said, I am. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus has said, I am. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, found him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father in law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there, keeping warm. And they said to him, You are not one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Did I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, he would not have been you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, for this I I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth 
listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is true? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again. Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, king of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. He said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he is the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid, and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now, many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but as he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, In order that this passage of scripture might be fulfilled, that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clovis, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. It was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Please kneel.
Please stand. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the body might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened, so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now, in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Stay standing for the solemn intercession. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, to unite her throughout the world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. O 
Almighty and the living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed. Hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. For catechumens, let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their innermost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of catechumens that reborn at the font of baptism they may be added to the number of your adopted children and we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the unity of Christians let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty and the living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered. Look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Jewish people, let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. <clears throat> Let us stand. Almighty ever living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever living God, Grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray also. For those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us pray. Let us stand. 
Almighty, ever living God, who created all peoples to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you, come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so, in gladness, confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us heal. Let us stand. Almighty and living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of people. Look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gifts be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated at this time, and as we prepare 
for Holy Communion, the ushers will take up the collection. Please stand. Our Father. Our Savior Jesus Christ. To the King and the power of the Lord and Lord now and Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Almighty, ever living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ. Preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you wish at this time to come up and venerate the cross, you may. I ask you to exit, come up, and then exit by the side doors. Also, I will be standing there, as is our custom here at Sacred Heart. I have a relic of the true cross, two splinters taken from the wood of the cross, and I'll bless you with that if you wish. Confessions, I'll hear confessions and for. 